And now I'm pleased to present Carol Cameron, our opening keynote speaker for November. Carol Cameron is the Executive Director of Canada's first alongside unit and certified leadership coach. Carol, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Carol, um, ha uh, Carol has asked that uh, and kind of started our chat uh, that you can see here by asking us to uh, share our wildest dreams uh, and what we'd like to see come true um, from our midwifery hearts. And she's encouraging you to um, respond and share during her presentation. So Carol, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody who just spoke before me for those wonderful, inspiring, and very important messages. So this is Cam's first virtual talk at the conference. And typically, you would think your first kickoff keynote gets the conference started on the right foot, inspires you, and sets the tone. But let's just get one little thing out of the way. 2020 has been a brutal year so far. As if it wasn't enough that we're all trying to live as human beings during a pandemic, we're working through it. We're caring for other humans and all the effort, anxiety, and uncertainty that comes with that. And, you know, not to mention what's happening to our neighbors, you know, south of the border. And I guess as of now, that story is stay, stay tuned. It's been tough. There's a lot of scorched earth and thinking ahead right now, I don't know about you, but it just doesn't feel all that reassuring to me sometimes. But here's the thing, and this really is the thing the amount of visionary ideas, new models, out of the box thinking, and just good old let's try something new mentality is astounding to me in midwifery right now. There are midwives extending their scope in order to serve communities in ways that none of us ever imagined would be possible. From primary care of infants beyond six weeks, contraception, abortion care, running their own units, and leading interprofessional teams caring for marginalized and high-risk populations. Midwives are breaking ground in leadership in a way we've never done before, and we're challenging widely held views of our profession. For me, it's just all kinds of crazy and fantastic and super exciting. And the great thing is that in all the work that goes into the service of people and communities, midwives are serving themselves. We are positioning our profession in an entirely new light and bringing our model of care to people who would not normally have access to it and growing as leaders and influencers. And that's pretty cool for an otherwise messed up year. So, you know, I've always believed that chaos is pretty fertile ground for visions and dreams to become true and for leaders to come forth out of the woodwork and blossom. And that transition often comes as a result of, well, just simply annoyances, right? And dissatisfaction and growing weary and sick of dealing with the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, think forest fires the ones that nature started, even when we did have a perfect ecosystem. They're hugely destructive, but they're needed for new growth. And over what can seem like a mere blip, you get this whole new forest and it's home to flora and fauna that are much more adapted than before. Now, I hear from midwives on a pretty regular basis who want to run an idea past somebody. They want to ask questions or do a deep dive on their own career goals. And I get pretty excited about that. But I also know that for everyone who's realized a dream, made a big change, grown as a person, a leader, a champion, there are countless more among us who never get there, despite maybe they had the best idea ever. So if I'm speaking to you, and by you, I mean this. You have a treasure trove of ideas, but they never seem to get past the thinking about them process. Maybe you don't even think about them that much, but they keep popping up nonetheless. And likely, if you're really frustrated and you need a change, but you're not sure what that is, the same idea keeps coming up again and again and again, maybe even years, and it can keep you up at night. You want to do something with it, but you don't know what, and you don't even know where to start. And truth is, you've talked yourself out of it already a million times. Am I talking to you? Are you out there? I'm kind of sure you are. And so this is for you. And if this sounds nothing like you and you have everything you want, you never let yourself get doubts get in the way. Well, you're freaking amazing. And I worship you. And I'm not kidding. I really do. But what you need to do is you need to go out and find somebody to mentor and work with to help them get where they want to be. Because together, we're all better. And even small, seemingly insignificant changes do us all a great service. 
there's nothing insignificant about personal growth and professional growth. Now, when I was asked by CAM organizers to be the keynote, you know, you'd think they were under a pretty safe assumption that I have my act together. And I guess most days that's true, but you know, to be totally transparent, I'm just like everybody else. I really am. I get nervous. I'm probably talking a little fast right now. I suffer from fear of failure and I procrastinate to avoid things that are difficult. In fact, I'm a master at procrastination. Sound familiar? So while I'm pretty comfortable speaking to a crowd and I've done it lots before, I rely on audience reaction to know my message is landing in the right way. And I have no idea what you're thinking right now. So this is really outside of my comfort zone. I'm feeling somewhat responsible to get us off to a great start. I mean, if this is a terrible flop, are you gonna stick around for the rest? So it's kind of a lot of pressure, but let's recap. So I am who I am, faults and all. I signed up for this. I might not be entirely sure I'm up for it and I can see the downsides and it's uncomfortable. Sound familiar? But despite all of it, I'm here, I'm doing it and I'm really allowing myself to be vulnerable to make a point. I will do this and my message will land like a dart at a bullseye in a championship game for some of you. And that's better than great for me. So the title of the talk is Get Out of My Own Way and someone out there might be thinking, that sounds a little blamey. What do you mean by that? Well, what I wanna talk about is how you and I and all of us just get in our own way sometimes, but that it's really not our fault and we can't help ourselves. I'm also gonna ask you these two questions. Who are you and what do you want? Big questions, right? So while I'm gonna give you a few ideas to chew on about how you can sort those things out, I will not be tying it all up in a pretty bow for you at the end of our time together. In fact, if you spend the next few weeks or months walking around struggling a bit with those questions, that's part of the growth process. Now, despite millions of years of evolution, we all still pack around an incredibly primitive part of our brain. You might've heard of it. The reptilian brain, the dinosaur brain. My favorite is the lizard brain. And it's a really real thing. And I'm not a neuroscientist, not even close, but I stumbled across this and became fascinated by it several years ago. And it was pretty mind blowing information to me. I have since learned to recognize when the lizard, my lizard is vying for control and how to deal with it. And how you deal with it is to stop letting it be in control, at least when it's not warranted. And the best part about knowing all this stuff is that there's a legitimate scientifically backed, take it to the bank, irrefutable reason why we get in our own way. It's not you, not really, it's that lizard brain and no one can really blame you for answering the call. So we'll talk a little bit about today on some ideas to tame that beast and stop letting it get in your own way. But first, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey, if you don't mind, because I think we see ourselves and others and through stories. And I wasn't always someone who could do what I'm doing right now, lead huge projects, challenge and change the status quo, mentor and coach people, and mostly get what I want, not by a long shot. And I can make a direct link to three really challenging times in my life that resulted in tremendous self-growth once I was on the other side of them. And all of these things were super hard to get through at the time, but guess what? There are perks, real perks to weathering tough times. And I'm not making this up. It's a term, sorry, caught, coined by psychologists called post-traumatic growth or PSG. And the theory here is that people who go through adversity often experience major personal growth on the other side as a result of that. It's not the same as being resilient, which is about bouncing back. PSG is all about growth. And for me, those are two entirely different things. So in 1988, I was a new mom and really, really unhappy, like depressed unhappy. I was in a marriage that was incredibly toxic. I was stressed all the time. And I didn't have a lot in my life, I need to say, outside of my new baby that brought me much joy. And for some parents who will tell you that's enough, that's fantastic. But for me, it just wasn't even close. Now I had pretty big potential in school and some earlier career choices, but I never really capitalized on any of them. And I was reminded of this recently by a meme that goes like this. For Halloween, I'm going as a former gifted child and my whole costume is about people asking me, what are you supposed to be? And me saying, I was supposed to be so many things. 
so my battery was pretty empty all the time. And I um, did what anybody would do, of course, in that situation, I became a midwife. But seriously, that was about being open and finding something that did charge my battery. And despite all the challenges and self-doubts and all the other people's self-doubts, I did that. The instinct to survive is strong and so should the instinct be to thrive. Midwifery was like a drug to me, a really good one. And I needed to have it in my life. I did whatever I had to do, including ending the toxic marriage, doing the single thing mom for a while, working a million jobs, whatever it took. And in short, I became incredibly resourceful. And for a long time, I was really, really happy. And becoming a midwife was finally that thing that was missing for me, which is what made the next low point so hard. At some point, I started to fall out of love with midwifery. And it, it was great, I was still committed, but I had a lot of questions about the way I did it and the impact that it was having on myself and some of my colleagues. Now my midwife, the one who caught my babies, who apprenticed me and who started a practice with me had a big old flaming burnout and headed for the hills. I mean, literally she went to the mesas of Arizona. I was devastated and my eyes were open to the irony of the price that people, women, were paying to care for other women. And I thought, I just need to find a way forward from this. So in 2001, while I was mulling this over and over again in my mind, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at the Association of Ontario Midwives Conference. And at that time, all this was on my mind. And so I dared to challenge everybody to take a look at ourselves, to ask if what we thought we were building at that time was really what still made sense. And I posed this question. Do we want midwives to be a niche service for a few, or do we see midwives as becoming the preferred provider for low-risk pregnancy and birth care? And if the latter, we need to change it up and make room for other ways of working. Well, let me tell you, there was not a lot of folks ready for that message back then. I should have worn a flat jacket. It wasn't pretty. And I lost a few people that I thought were friends. Take home message, being brave can cost you. And second take home message, it was worth it. So again, low point, but huge growth. And I learned that putting yourself out there, it's really not as scary as you tell yourself it will be. So for me, the way forward after that chapter was to get my master's and stretch myself beyond me, myself, and I. And no huge surprise, I chose to do my thesis on why midwives leave the profession within a few years of graduation. Now, that was a little depressing, and it was just sad, right? Such a waste. But it made me fall in love with midwifery all over again, and I started seeing potentials and or solutions to barriers. So I leveraged all this in leading our group at the hospital, working with other groups and really embracing change. And truth is, I think I became pretty addicted to change. My practice colleagues at the time can attest to that as they became very, at uh, times, unwilling participants. It became a well-known signal to others of challenges ahead when Carol would come to a meeting and say, so I've been thinking. For a long time, that was a great place to be for me though. And I was flexing my creativity, growing a presence for midwives, forging a solid foothold in a hospital and having real influence on birthing culture at the community level. But you know what, in all that time, I don't think I ever asked myself once what I wanted. I just took it for granted I was doing it, but was I? So I did build a bit of reputation and that led me to being asked to lead the childbirth team at Markham Stovall Hospital in 2010. And I became the first midwife employed by a hospital to manage a childbirth unit. I managed a staff of 120 nurses, a huge budget, and all that comes with it. And it was a really big learning curve. I went from expert to novice overnight, which is super uncomfortable. And I'm not kidding when I say I drove in my driveway every night for two weeks, deciding I was quitting the next morning. I didn't. I persevered. And in the end, you know, that turned out to be one of the greatest learning and growth opportunities I have ever had. I was able to change practice and policies and really influence culture here. And in short, it was just really amazing. So it's hard to know if the next and really the most challenging event in my life had not happened, whether I would still be doing that today and whether the next really big thing would have never seen the light of day and whether I would ever have really gone on to do that nameless thing that I wanted to do. In 2013, my husband, Paul, had a stroke and not a little one. That morning we were chatting as we got ready for work and that afternoon he's in the hospital and we're waiting to find out if he'll survive. He woke from it and he couldn't walk or talk 
and I'm glad to say he's come a long, long way. He still suffers from pretty significant aphasia, but he has his mobility back for the most part and he's super independent. And sure, it was dark and hard and scary for all of us. But again, I learned a lot and I grew. And there were two pivotal things that happened to make that the case. The first was that I dived into everything I could learn about the brain and how it can recover from a traumatic brain injury. And somewhere in there, that's where I stumbled upon the primitive or lizard brain thing I mentioned earlier. And there was a huge eureka moment for me. Then I made the decision that no matter how much that lizard thought it was risky and dangerous to do something really outside the box, I was going to accept being very uncomfortable and I was going to go for it. I was finally going to take that big, crazy, wildly important dream I've been carting around up in my head for years out of my head onto paper and get it into other people's heads, make it other people's dreams and make it happen. And that is the story behind Canada's first alongside Luffy unit and my role as an executive director there. Now, it wasn't as easy as all that and sure it took time and effort, but you know, once you know what you want, sometimes the rest is just tenacity. I knew I needed to go from great big vision and ideas to concrete goals and really honing in on what was important. And that's when I discovered coaching. Now I heard of life coaches and professional coaches and I even knew somebody who was one, but I didn't really know what she did. I thought they were kind of advisors or cheerleaders. A coach is neither. A coach helps you unlock you, helps you see who you are, what you want, what's important and what you're willing to risk to get it. And then they hold you really accountable to your plan. Now I mentor and advise people all the time. It's kind of my thing and it has its place, but true change comes from inside, not from outside. And that's what happens when you're coached. The change comes from inside. Without coaching, I don't think I could have pulled off the AMU or anything I've done since. I believe this so much that I went back to school and I'm now a certified leadership coach myself. I started coaching people in my organization a while back and just last week I was offered a part-time position as Markham Stovall's first embedded innovation and leadership coach. Now we're still working on the details and I'll still keep my role at the AMU, but for now this is a very transitional time for me. The next executive director is out there waiting to go for it and get what they want. For the reminder of my career and maybe my life, I really just want to support others to grow and lead and build their own dreams. And I can't think of a better legacy. Now, an important point I just want to make here before I go on to the next point here is that I'm talking about growth after getting through a tough time. And tough time is defined by all of us in very different ways, obviously. So this isn't really about how to overcome. It's just an entirely different thing. And depending on the person or circumstances, maybe that involves therapy or whatever it needs to involve for you. But this is about who you become and what you become and what the possibilities are after you come on the other side. So that was my journey, but what will yours be and how do you get there? So I'm gonna give you some tips and tools to think about and we'll, as we get through this and, but, and ask you some questions. And, the questions and answers are for you and you know you're all different so feel free to write them down and post if you want put them on a notepad your phone but please or say them out loud but please do get it out of the of your head if you need more time and no doubt you will then get the questions down and come back to them we need to work on getting stuff from being only in your head i want to loop back for a second to the loser brain as a child, I was told I could do anything if I worked hard enough at it, and also that I wasn't good enough. By the same parent, and sometimes in the same context, super confusing and super sunk in. Think about our brains as programs that someone or something is always feeding code into. It's frightening, and when you think about it, that literally anyone, anyone can say anything and it gets in here, and then we reference it when we think about ourselves. I have four, amazing grandchildren and one on the way any day now. And our oldest Karis just turned six and she is funky and curious and smart and full of confidence and totally convinced she can do anything. But I know it's only a matter of time before someone tells her she's not all that. And it breaks my heart. We get socialized as children, as boys, as girls, as women what, to certain messages. And then we get socialized to certain messages about the career we all chose. What are those messages? Think about them. Post them if you like. Write them down. For me, 
I don't know, you're different. You, you're on our turf. You're not as good as us. You don't fit in. Think about that. And please add others to the chat box or write them down for yourself. You'll start to see rather quickly that a lot of us are telling ourselves the same thing. And the really crazy thing about it is you don't need to really believe any of this when you're being logical for it to have an impact on you. How many of us are telling ourselves things about ourselves that aren't based on our own experience, but somebody else's? There's someone else's coded message and it got stuck in there for a future rewind anytime you want to take a risk. And that's a pretty sure far way to stop progress in its tracks, whether that's by design or not. Taking a risk. That's the crux of the issue for most of us. It's not comfortable, it's not familiar, it's dangerous. And that's where your lizard brain comes in. Your brain, that part of it anyway, has a primary function and that's to protect you from danger. Now, imagine how useful that was when our forebears were hunting and their handy dandy lizard brain could send a message that danger was its life. Because getting eaten by a lion, it's a pretty serious and real risk if you're out at night in the savannah with nothing but a loincloth. But it's 2020 and you're an adult with a degree and a home and a degree or two maybe and life experiences and a credit card and you're not in imminent danger of being eaten by a lion. But your brain doesn't know this. It just knows that this crazy thing you want to do or say or plan is dangerous. And so it tells you, hold up sister, are you really sure you want to go there? Because what if this happens, what if that happens? And so on and so on. And the next thing you know, you're flooded with all kinds of thoughts and feelings. Thoughts like this will never work. What will people think? You don't have what it takes. People won't like it. People won't like you the worst, right? Feelings can be a rising heart rate, horrible tummy, you know, flush face, anxiety. It's just a horrible feeling, but it's a direct response, physical response to your thoughts. Now, look, changing this isn't gonna happen overnight, but just being aware of what's happening, it can get you started. And really it's all it took for me, just awareness and then working on it. I can't say it still doesn't happen, for example, one of the not so great things about being a leader is that sometimes you have to have difficult conversations with people. And when I do, I will tend to put them off. I toss and turn about it at night and I get anxious. But in the past, I would have allowed that to put me on the path to total avoidance. I just wouldn't have done it. Now I acknowledge the thoughts and the feelings. I measure them against a real risk of being eaten by a lion and I make the decision to do what I am, what I wanna do. It gets simpler all the time, believe me. Um, and think of a scenario for you that you've been avoiding. Maybe it's also a conversation you've been putting off and your thoughts and feelings are getting in your way. Can you think of one? Now, ask yourself this, what's important to you about that? What are you willing to risk to get it? Now in true coaching, we'd be having a conversation and I would then ask you another question based on the one you just gave me. And we won't get that far today, but it's a start. But let me ask all of you this. If you could have everything you wanted, right? But in order to get it, you needed to put up with a freezing cold shower every day, would you do it? Would you deal with being uncomfortable so you could grow and do all the things you wanted? Well, those thoughts and feelings you're having and that your primitive brain is throwing down to protect you are just that. They're a freezing cold shower, a beasting, a trolley horse. That's what they are. So next time this is happening, ask yourself this, what exactly are you trying to protect me from? And sometimes another good question to ask yourself is what's another perspective on this? What you shouldn't do is ignore the lizard brain. It won't go away until you do. So acknowledge it and then do your own assessment of the risks. Engage the logical part of your brain, your neocortex, and really think this through. So say if you're work, walking down a dark alley late at night though, and you hear footsteps approaching, you might want to listen to that primitive brain and take the appropriate action. But if a work colleague gives you a side glance in the middle of an idea pitch, maybe it's just a glance, maybe it's surprise, engagement, whatever. It certainly doesn't need to mean you need to stop thinking about where you're going with that idea. I told you a bit about my journey and for sure at some point I was getting past the fear and the doubt and trying new things, but I still didn't know what I wanted. And this period, the period I described earlier about falling in love with midwifery again was full of inspiration and ideas, but they were all over the place. And honestly, I was like a crow. We're moving on from the next shiny sparkling thing to the next. I see it as um, searching behavior. And it was exciting, but I was think good for my creative side for sure, but I was far from focused. I did discover though, that imagining and visioning and selling ideas and creating was so my thing. 
and that maintaining status quo was not. And that realization, that moment when I had no doubt who I was, was when I finally figured out what I wanted. So my big take home here for you is know who you are so you can get what you want. So who are you? I believe many of us think we know who we are, but I challenge you to all rethink that. Most of us have many different personas. The one we are in our natural, unfettered, unstressed state, and the one we bring to work, our public face. They're not always the same. How many of you meet a work colleague, someone you're not close to, but you have an opinion about them at a social event and think, wow, that's a whole other side to that person. For example, someone who's very people oriented and in really engaged in relationships and making sure everyone's heard and included and feels okay about things might have a really hard time at work um, when they have to make decisions that not everybody will be happy with. And if that person is trying to lead a team or a project or is accountable to someone else, that might not turn out so well. Sometimes different personas show up because they need to. Now, wouldn't it be great to know that this is, to know this about yourself and do the things where you are who you are and what is needed? Because imagine doing what comes naturally is enforced in so second nature, you don't even know you're doing it. That's worth going for. So why is this essential question so hard? Well, because whether you're 20 or 60, you've probably spent your whole life being told it was desirable to somebody else other than yourself. Have you ever been asked to be more cooperative or suggested to be more flexible or more accommodating, more nice, be less demanding, less questioning, maybe the opposite? I think we're all accustomed to others telling us what we should be, but we stop asking ourselves who we already are. So how you can figure that out is you can invest in a good psychometric tool, something please better than Myers or Briggs because you don't want to be boxed into introvert or extrovert, it's not very helpful. And there are better tools out there and coupled with a professional who can coach you are well worth the investment. But in the meantime, if you're trying to figure this out, there's a few simple ways to get you closer. Think about a person, doesn't have to be related to work, who you see as a leader, who you admire, and you think is shining in your role. Write their name down and start listing the qualities that you attribute to that person. Maybe it's humor, maybe they're dedicated, whatever it is that you think is positive. positive. Now, it's not a validated tool like a psychometric tool, but there's a good chance you just described yourself. We naturally gravitate to the qualities in ourselves that we see mirrored in others. And maybe you're not there yet as far as using these qualities to tell, propel you, but you probably have a lot of them naturally. And another clue is this, what do people come to for you for advice? What do you get asked to do all the time? Come up with a creative idea, organize something, talk to someone for them, Whatever it is, there's a clue in there for you for sure. So start thinking about these things, start listing your own qualities. This is your secret sauce. This is your secret power. I'm getting the signal to wrap up and I feel like I've got so much to say. Anyway, I'll try to, uh, try to do that. So um, this can all be about making some small but meaningful changes in your professional or personal life. And, but honestly, if they're so small, why is it so hard to do? It's okay to say I want more. It's okay to say I want something better and I want to be noticed. I hope some of you are starting to think about these two big questions, who am I and what do I want? Do the work and the rest follows. It will take work and there are people who can help you. There are leadership courses aimed at us in, that in healthcare, especially that explore these things up front because who you are is the most fundamental part of leading and changing and growing. You can hire a coach like I did a good coach will really listen to you, ask you those questions and crack you open and allow all the possibilities inside to spill out. There was a time when I would have joked about this being shameless advertising, but I'm not ashamed. I'm really good at what I do. But besides me, there's lots of coaches out there and you'll find your perfect fit. So now I need to summarize. Oh my goodness. All right. Growth happens following adversity. There are countless opportunities in chaos. Don't ignore your lizard brain. Acknowledge it and then do your own assessment of the danger. Get used to being uncomfortable, it won't kill you. Do the work you need to do in order to know who you are, the essence of you, that is your superpower. Practice asking yourself, what do I want? Do that a lot, like I mean a lot, every day, every situation. When I'm struggling with decisions, I self-coach and these are my top five questions I always ask myself and I recommend you do as well. Who am I? What do I want? What's important to me about this? What am I willing to risk to get it? And what is the next step I can take here? Now, I talked about figuring out your secret sauce or superpower. 
And these things that you excel at that set you apart and give you clues to who you are. I believe that midwives are the superheroes in reproductive care. So why doesn't our healthcare system look like we are? Who are we? What do we want? Recently, a colleague posted an article in the Canadian Midwives Facebook group about tipping points in society. It's about how minority groups and movements, despite all kinds of effort, only can really change a very small percentage of others into seeing things their way until they reach a tipping point. The tipping point is 25%. At 25%, groups can convert a majority of others into buying into their vision. And guess what? That's where we are. Or we're very, very close. Imagine not going for it and being that close. So let's tip the scale, push it right over and be the primary healthcare provider of choice. Listen, I played the game for years of keeping my head down and being accommodating and flexible and nice and whatever it took to win over others over and build trust and get inside. And we all did that. And many of you still do. And I know it's a winning strategy and it's necessary, but it can also slowly rob you on the inside. I think we're beyond that. I think we can be louder, bolder, more demanding. We don't need to settle for tokens of integration anymore. As midwifery grows, our leaders must also grow. This is an area we've neglected as a profession, but it's not too late to get it right. Midwife leaders are essential and needed in our profession. Midwife leaders should be showing up in government, politics, hospitals, public health, law, and policy and healthcare organizations. And we need to make a serious investment in getting there. So this is my challenge to all the provincial and territorial organizations and specifically to the Board of CAN. What part will you play in making sure this happens? 2020 is the year of a worldwide pandemic and it's the year of the midwife. The pandemic will finally end and we will be who we are at the end of it. Make the choice to use that struggle and all the others that come with living because difficult times are inevitable. Look for the beauty in chaos, opportunities, learn, flex, grow and lead. You all have an enormous ability to influence the shape of our future for years to come. Make every day the year of the midwife and every year and every day the year of you. Thank you all for giving me the precious gift of your time. Thank you, Carol. So much love coming through the chat for you. I just wanna share it a little bit because it can feel so, um, uh, you know, you're not getting the love from the crowd, but I've been reading it. And some of your beautiful friends are saying things like your positive energy is really coming through the screen and they wanna bottle you as an energy <laughs> drink. <laughs> um, and, um, really, Carol, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to echo uh, all of these pieces that you've brought together for us. One of the comments in the chat was actually lots of thank yous, lots of your awesomes. Um, Carlene in the chat uh, asked, you know, is this something that we would like to see in our midwifery programs is to have uh, coaching be part of, you know, because listening to you speak, I also feel like inherently we start to grow some of these skills, but maybe to support our own clients through this year long journey and relationship that we have with them. But could you speak to what it would do to actually uh, grow our midwifery leadership to have this as part of an education program? Sorry. Yeah, no, I think you're really onto something. And, and I have actually had some talks um, with some of the um, education programs around this. But it, like uh, what well, I said, and we neglected it, you know, I think as organization of midwives across the country, we did such a phenomenal, and I mean, I don't have to take anything away from the phenomenal job that we all did in building excellent care, evidence-based care, quality care, you know, really making it count for our clients and ourselves. But I think we just kind of forgot or neglected the leadership component to some degree. So, I mean, whether that's building it into a master's program, whether that's supporting people to seek out programs, but I think, yes, coaching is something that you can, you know, coach a coach and you can really embed it into programs. And that's why, you know, the hospital's embedding it because what happens is you bring in experts from outside and they come in, they deliver something, but it's months later that a person often has the courage or the idea or the inspiration comes to them and then guess what there's nobody to go to right so just that sustainability thing never happens so I think we could 
easily, for sure, make it part of our culture. And another great question um, coming from Alex Bacon, asking about how do you how do you cultivate that energy um, when you're feeling burnt out? Uh, you know, to make that space um, or those commitments to sort of begin that journey of exploration, because as you said, part of it requires that vulnerability. Um, I just wonder when when you arrive at that space, uh, is there something that can help? Uh, you know put the wheels in motion? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's journey is different. For me, a lot of it, it's gonna sound really overly simplistic and I certainly don't mean to be, but it's really about being open, right? So just being open to those opportunities, even in those dark, dark times. And I really do believe that, you know, we, if we stay open and we have what I call a growth mindset as opposed to a closed mindset, that we really will always come out on the other side better um, and, and learning something. So, and I talked, I think a lot about this in my talk, just letting, allowing that uncomfortableness to be there. It, it's, it's hard, right? And uh, we're all human and we all have it, but I think just kind of starting to get comfortable with that, it, it helps a lot, that and just being open. It's funny, I'm just reflecting on my own experience with coaching um, because I had the privilege of attending an Indigenous leadership forum last year for the first time, like just all Indigenous um, women and two-spirit and gender diverse people. And everybody there had said that they had had coaching. And I was like, what is a coach? <laughs> And so naturally, uh, one of the people who attended offered to coach me. And the process really is very individualized, isn't it? Um, like I sort of thought it would be like someone helping carve out a pathway, but it's really about letting you carve out the pathway, um, which was a lot more work. <laughs> Um, what do you think, you know, as, as I'm leaving this role in the, the, of the Canadian Association of Midwives, what can our associations um, do to play and to foster a leadership um, role uh, in terms of, you know, growing that sustainability of practice? Is there things that we can do um, nationally, provincially? Yeah, I mean, I think we can, um, well, we can propel leaders in many ways. And, and you and I talked about, you know, having um, something like a midwife innovating award or, you know, a midwife leadership award or, you know, connecting people with people, um, you know, bringing coaching into the organization, having it be accept, accept, <clears throat> sorry, accessible to people. So I do think there's a lot that an organization can do. I would be happy to put my head together with you and, you know, talk about it because I think that there's a lot of information and a lot of opportunities for us to do that. And I think the time is now. I think there's people out there. I'm so excited to know there's so many students that were listening because, you know, you're the future. You were, you were it. And, you know, long after I'm dust, uh, a lot of you will be doing really great, amazing things. I know you will. And so, you know, it's super exciting. And I think we've got this great opportunity and energy right now of people who want to grow into that. So I don't think there's no, there isn't a will. I think it's just we have to find some vehicles for people. Yeah. Carol, I really want to congratulate you. I feel like the fact that you are going to be the coach for Markham Stouffville Hospital, I feel like this a massive organization to, to take on that step. Um, I know that this is, you know, you're, you've grown from doing individual counseling, you've gone on your own journey and you've learned so much. Um, what do you anticipate this kind of role, uh, you know, the, the fact that this would be part of your organization can create, uh, you know, moving forward for, for the institution? Well, I'll tell you, if, if, if I have two seconds to tell you a funny story. I had something in my head about, because I told you status quo isn't my thing, and the alongside and free unit is great, and we are building out other innovation, but, you know, somebody else could come and run this. And so I was sort of thinking, and I... I connected with somebody who was a coach, but just goes to show you, you don't always have the right fit. And I suggested to her, I might go pitch this idea. And she told me, oh, don't do that because you're talking big vision and passion and it's all great, but you need to go with a logical mind. 
And so she gave me advice that I didn't ask for, which is what a coach should never do. And I thought, oh my God, maybe she's right. Then I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to do my thing. So I went to a VP and I just whoa, pitched this idea. And she, I mean, literally 24 hours later, she wanted to do this with me. So what am I saying here? You have to just be yourself, right? You have to kind of go for it. And I think what it means in the organization where I came at it from this was this. Frontline workers, whether you're a midwife, a nurse, a porter, or whatever you are, you have the best idea. You have it, not somebody at the top, because you know it, you work it. And there's, think of like 100,000 ideas happening right now in people's brains in this organization, and there's nowhere to go with it. And you don't have the confidence to go with it. So I, so the idea here, and I said we're still working out the details, is that there's somebody embedded here who can help people get their dreams, their visions, their little ideas and their big ideas out there and that we can take them and run with them. And together we'll just be an amazing organization. It'll be fantastic. I love it. Thank you for lighting our fire, Carol. Thank you for, for starting us up with you know, the, this concept of, of getting out of our own way of, of being vulnerable, of exploring what that truly means to unite uh, who your personal self is and your professional self is to be your truest and most authentic self and, uh, and to a change, like to, to create the meaningful change we really want to see um, in our healthcare system. Um, I, I, I'm very grateful to you as are all of our um, people who are chatting, saying that you're very inspiring. Some people are crying. Some people are saying, thank you. Great leadership. Everybody is, is excited to apply. Even I'm seeing these notes saying, uh, you know, I want to apply what you said, but you read those questions too fast. <laughs> Can you read us those five questions and close us up with that? <laughs> Who am I? Well, well, the recap of that was just um, my, yeah, so my self-coaching questions are, who am I? And what I mean by that is, who am I in the moment? Like, what, who, what is my role, right? Like, if I have to do something, it's like, what is my role right now? That's what I meant by who am I? It's not always that big, like, who am I at the end of my life kind of thing, but just who am I right now? What, what is, what? Um, what do I want? Like, what am I trying to achieve here? What's important to me about that? That's really, you really need to tease that out. What am I willing to risk to get, get it? That kind of addresses the, um, the barriers that you're putting up. And you link this with why it's important to you. And then you get your self-motivation. And then really important, what's the next step I can take to get there? Because if you don't do something concrete about it, right? Um, it just still is this idea. So when I coach people, I always say, okay, so they come up with something they're going to do, but then I say, well, when are you going to do it? And right. Like, so out of 10 steps, maybe you just plan that the next day you're going to do something, just do something. It's about forward propulsion, right? So getting just started with something, chunking it out. It's a great first step. Thank you, Carol. You are just a blessing. And this has been such a nice way to spend time with all of you this afternoon. I want to thank everyone and the participants who are joining us. And um, I hope to see you all throughout November. Um, I believe this session is recorded. So folks who missed it will be able to see it again is what I'm hoping. And, uh, and there'll be some recorded content. And of course, every Thursday, um, we will be uh, uh, live as well, just like this. So uh, we hope to see you then. Take care, everybody. Bye. Have a great conference. Bye, everyone. Okay. Oh, Carol really went, eh? <laughs>